Welcome to our February 2022 session of Writers at Home. Um, thank you all for joining us today on this beautiful sunny Sunday for this very special reading uh, with Heather Newton in conversation with Vicki Lane. And as always, we're so grateful to Malaprops for giving us this virtual space. If you want to purchase Heather's or Vicki's books, please consider supporting our local indie bookstore and buying them through Malaprops. You can find direct links to Heather's and Vicky's books um, on the Malaprops calendar listing for this event at malaprops.com slash event. And while you're at it, you can check out all of Malaprops' amazing events on that link as well, um, including a virtual book launch with Dolly Parton and James Patterson for their upcoming novel, Run Rose Run. That ticketed launch will be held on March 6th, and for $30, you can get a copy of Run Rose Run and a link to the YouTube live stream. For more information and to buy tickets, visit malaprops.com slash event and click on March 6th. Um, one more quick announcement before we get started. Uh, Ten-week classes in the Great Smokies Writing Program start this week, but you still have time to register for our, two of our five-week classes starting the week of March 21st. Um, the first is a No Frills Poetry Workshop with Orison Books founder and editor Luke Hankins. Uh, and if you're looking for a place to workshop a few of your poems, this is the place for you. Um, and our second class is the fantastic acrostic writing workshop with fiction writer, poet, spoken word artist, and local renaissance woman, Allie Marshall. And if you've never heard of acrostic art, it's art made in response to another piece of art. So that could be visual, auditory, literary. So if you just want to get some inspiration for your fiction pieces, uh, this would be the place for you. So for more information on Luke's and on Allie's classes, check out our website at greatsmokies.unca.edu. So that wraps up our announcements. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Vicki Lane. Vicki has been with the Great Smokies Writing Program for many years and is the acclaimed author of the Elizabeth Goodweather Appalachian Mystery Series, as well as The Day of Small Things and her most recent novel, And the Crows Took Their Eyes. When she isn't teaching or writing, she tends to and blogs about her farm and garden in Madison County. And seriously, you need to check out her blog. It's at Victory, Vicki Lane Mysteries on Blogspot and the pictures are just gorgeous. So I'm so glad Vicki is here today to introduce and speak with Heather Newton. This is a real treat for the program. So Vicki, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lily. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be in conversation with Heather about this new book. Um, there is so much going on in McMullen Circle. Uh, 12 linked stories at a small boarding school, but there is so much more to each character than is, than is immediately apparent. I kept thinking of the Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, I Contain Multitudes. And that's, that's exactly true of each of these stories, of each of these characters. Heather, the little book, it made me think of a magic trick where you open a box and inside it is a larger box. <laughs> you open that box and there's an even larger box. Uh, maybe you could begin by telling us about your inspiration for this novel. H have you ever been a part of a small academic uh, circles such as this? I've never been a part of a residential school, like a boarding school, um, but I, I have a disproportionate number of teacher friends. Um, so part of the inspiration was hanging out with my teacher friends and just um, listening in on the combination of humor and um, sarcasm that they exhibit when their students aren't around and just the devotion that they exhibit when their students are around. Um, but the, the inspiration for this collection originally came from my um, husband. His, he grew up on the campus of the Tulula Falls School in Georgia. Um, his dad was a history teacher there and they lived in campus housing until he was about seven or eight. Um, and they lived there when the great Carl Walinda came to Tallulah Falls and walked the tightrope ac across Tallulah Gorge. So one of the first stories that he charmed me with when we started dating was the, um, the story of the day Walinda came. And uh, Walinda walked the gorge, which if you've ever seen that gorge, uh, it's quite a, quite a feat. Um, and what my husband remembers most is the hot dogs that they sold. Um, they, they thought the world was coming to Tallulah Falls and they ordered way more hot dogs than they wound up using, which meant that um, the, the kids got to eat hot dogs uh, for the rest of that summer. <laughs> so, um, so that's where the first story inspiration came from. And then, um, then I wrote one more story. And then by the third one, I realized I had I was working on a collection. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just wonderful. 
in spite of setting the, the book in a specific time and place, uh, 6970 in Tanola Falls, Georgia, you take us via flashbacks to other times and places uh, that have formed the characters in the book. Would you read us a bit from the chapter called Tupelo Rose? That's sure. Particularly. Yeah. Um, so the main character in the story is a, a former World War II um, tail gunner who has had problems with alcoholism and now lives in this community at the, the Victory Home, which is a recovery home for, for alcoholic men. Um, so this is the, his memory of um, when his plane was shot down. Boys, I can fly her, but I can't turn her around. Burton's voice had come over the intercom that night. I say we bail now before Germany. Where are we at, Captain? Sweeney said. Belgium. One by one, they bailed. Burton, the captain at the yoke. Danny waited for Burton. They were from the same hometown. The girl painted on the nose of the plane was a girl they both knew, Rose Price. They had named their plane Tupelo Rose in her honor, each hoping she'd choose him once they got home. By consent, they had taped her picture to the plane's control panel for luck. Now Tupelo Rose, her rudders useless, was grinding lower and lower, the pretty brunette on her nose destined for a fiery breakup. Burton emerged from the cockpit. He held up the photo of Rose, yellowed cellophane tape still stuck around the edges. Who's taken her, you or me? Rose smiled out at them, straight white teeth and a cashmere sweater Danny had got his hand under once. The plane lurched. He grinned at Burton, hit him on the arm to say all he couldn't say. You take the picture, I'm gonna get the girl. Burton tucked the photo inside his jacket and jumped. Danny was right behind him. A trick of the wind carried Burton away toward the river's far bank until Danny could no longer make out the grainy silk of his chute. With Burton went Danny's luck, all of it, tucked into the four corners of that snapshot. Burton escaped that night. Flemish resistance smuggled him out. After he got back and finished his 25 bombing runs in a new plane, the Army Air Force sent him on a hero's tour that finished up in Tupelo, where he married Rose Price. Life Magazine published their picture. Danny spent the war in a POW camp. By the time he got home, Rose was pregnant with Burton's second child, and the S shapes were jumping out at Danny everywhere, the repetition making him dizzy and sick. Danny's story is so heartbreaking um, and, and so, so true for so many vets, unfortunately. Um, and I love how in this story, we're introduced to Burton, who says the hero, who seems to have it all. But then later on in another chapter, we learn more about Burton. And whereas I didn't like him a lot originally, he becomes very sympathetic. Um, and this is this is what you do so beautifully um, throughout this. Uh, people who are just mentioned in passing in one chapter, like the two old ladies, then turn out to have an incredible backstory of their own. Um, and that's one reason I, I went back and read the book a second time, just to, to see how you do this. It's so clever. It's so well done. Uh, everyone has the story. And that's part of the... Um, the beauty of this book is that everyone's important. Everyone has a story that explains who they are, why they got there, uh, why they're the way they are. Um, the headmaster's dissatisfied wife, the teacher she's having an affair with, the cafeteria workers, the headmaster himself. Um, maybe you'd read us that scene where the headmaster is uh, remembering how his father embarrassed him. Sure. Um, yeah. and. I, I did try to give most of the characters um, a chance in the spotlight and also a little chance at redemption. They don't all get redeemed, but um, hopefully um, Burton does and, and hopefully the headmaster does as well. Um, so in this story, the headmaster, who's kind of a buttoned up, um, very serious fellow, it has gone up to Pennsylvania to visit his father who's suffering from dementia. So he goes into his childhood home. Uh, 
Let me make sure I'm reading the right thing. Hang on. <laughs> okay. On the middle shelf exhibited like a diploma was a familiar photograph of his smiling father holding the one patent he got on his only successful invention, a better chalkboard eraser. The patent itself was in a long yellowed envelope tucked into the corner of the frame. His father had been a manager at a janitorial company that cleaned office buildings at night. He noticed the janitors fighting over a certain type of sulfur colored sponge, one they could use dry or wet that devoured dust and dirty water alike. One night, his father used one of the sponges to wipe the chalkboard in the break room where he listed assignments and was amazed when the sponge ate the chalk dust and didn't need dusting itself. He brought some of the sponges home and glued them to pieces of wood to make erasers and emerged from his workroom announcing the end of eraser beating as we know it. Richard, who liked beating erasers for his teachers because it made him feel useful and special, was dismayed. But the things really worked. His father patented the eraser and had several thousand manufactured for sale. Richard's teachers loved the self-cleaning erasers and loved Richard's father. They got him to come in and talk to their classes about inventing. He demonstrated the eraser with a flourish and set off explosive science experiments while Richard sat stiffly at his desk. His father, optimistic, resigned from his job to devote himself to selling erasers, but demand wasn't what he had hoped. Money grew scarce. Richard's allowance stopped and his pants flapped two inches above his ankles because his parents couldn't afford to replace them. Finally, even Richard's jolly mother stopped laughing and his father went back to the janitorial company to grovel. The employer relented but made him work as a custodian for six months as punishment before returning him to management. Richard eased the patent out of the picture frame. Moisture had resealed its envelope. He opened it carefully and extracted the patent. He could hear his father's excited voice in the old fashioned language describing the patent's claims, its abstract, the field of invention, the prior art, Commonly used chalkboard erasers comprising laminated felt pads are prone to the collection of chalk dust on the surface, causing the efficiency of the erasers to drop markedly in short order and requiring frequent cleaning of the erasers. Under the heading description of the preferred embodiment, he read, the illustrative eraser consists of a resilient porous sponge rubber body affixed and generally coextensive with a hand grip member made of wood or other solid material. The body member shall have grooves extending lengthwise and disposed about its periphery. Richard wondered if there were any boxes of erasers left in his father's basement that he might salvage for the McMullen school. He tucked the patent in his breast pocket, then opened the door to the narrow cellar stairs and pulled the chain to the overhead light bulb. His sister hadn't cleaned down here. He waved an arm in front of his face to break spider webs as he descended the stairs. Along the back wall, just as he remembered, were several unopened cardboard boxes of erasers. He stepped around and over piles of other items to get them. The boxes had mildewed where they touched the wall, but he was hopeful that the erasers themselves would be intact. He ripped the seal off the first box and opened it. Surprised silverfish flowed outward like shiny drops of water from a fountain. Richard peered into the box. All that remained of the erasers was the wooden hand grip. The spongy body was completely gone, eaten by silverfish or dry rot. All the boxes were the same. Richard left them where they were, not bothering to close them. I, I love how at the end, the headmaster makes sort of a, unspoken vow that says he is determined not to be like his father. He won't do foolish things. He won't, he won't embarrass his children. Uh, and we can see how that has cost him so much of his humanity. It's what's made him so, so straight laced. Uh, but by the end of the chapter, you have a glorious scene where to please his daughter, he does indeed make a fool of himself, red clown nose and all. Uh, 
So many of your characters I found initially unlikable, but as you reveal more about them, I just love them. I wonder, do you have a favorite character or favorite story or story arc in the book? It's like asking a parent, who's your favorite child? <laughs> um, but I do have, have characters that hold my heart. Um, when I wrote the second story, which is the title story, McMullen's, McMullen, McMullen Circle, um, part of the, the inspiration for that story was me thinking, what if I had known my husband when we were both children? So he grew up in two little falls and I grew up in a, a pretty similar idyllic isolated community of an apartment complex in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and I was, I thought it would be fun to think about what if we had known each other. Um, so Lorna, the 10 year old girl character in the story is a lot like I was when I was that age. She is a person who spends a lot of time inside her own head and a lot of time in her imagination. Um, so if, if I have to pick a favorite, then I would pick her. Um, but honestly, I had so much fun writing all of these characters. I've got a cafeteria lady in the book. That was fun. Um, I've got two elderly lesbians who, um, who met in the 20s when they were young in New Orleans. Um, it, it was just a blast writing all of these stories. And I wrote most of them in um, Tommy Hayes' Great Smokies writing workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I had, it was before I had a published novel and I decided to sign up for Tommy's class and took his class for about three semesters over a course of two years and finished most of the stories in his class. So shout out to Tommy for helping me with those. I've still got his comments that he wrote on them. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, I thought of Lorna <clears throat> as being your voice. Um, and I loved how at the end you say she has had a lifetime of careful looking, mm -hmm. uh, which is of course, perfect for a writer. Uh, just, just lovely. And, the cover, I thought the cover was just magnificent. At first, I didn't think about it when I hadn't read the book. I just thought, well, that's a nice abstract design. But all these little closed circles, but then the ripples from them reach out and influence the others around them, which is exactly what's happening in your story. I think that's uh, just amazing. Did you have any input on the cover? Well, it's funny, I did not have input on the cover. Um, the publisher had asked me to send in some cover comps. So I had sent in some covers that I liked that I were kind of from that time period, the late 60s. Um, and then they sent me this and I don't know if everybody can see it, but it is, it, to me, it looks super abstract. And I was like, why did they put such an abstract cover on a collection that's really not abstract at all? And I was kind of baffled. And then my husband came in and immediately pointed out that it's a topo map. So mm -hmm. the, the concentric circles are, are a topographic map like a hiker would use. And um, I'm assuming the designer used a topo map of North Georgia for the design. Mm -hmm. So then it made sense to me that um, it reflects the, the sense of place that's important to the story collection. So then I decided I liked it after all. <laughs> Uh, I think I think it's it's a lovely cover. I, I think uh, the publisher does a good job with covers in general. Yeah, they do. And I always really think, you know, I don't know about you, Vicki, but I assume that the publisher knows more than I do about graphic yeah. design. And um, yeah. I, I would never like fight very hard on a cover because yeah. they know what they're doing and I don't. And so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's always my assumption, though I did suggest the cover of mine because I had a, a friend who had done this incredible woodcut. Yeah. And if you all haven't and, seen Vicky's and, um, beautiful I just cover. Said, yeah. This is, this is perfect for, for what we're doing here. So I was, I was delighted with that. Um, your black cover blurb says that the stories ask the question, who or what is a hero? And I think that's absolutely true. And the answer seems to be that there are heroes everywhere. Even Sarah, the headmaster's sometimes feckless wife and mother, uh, she has her moment. Uh, maybe you'd read that to us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, I've, I've talked to a couple of book clubs um, so far about the collection, and, and Sarah is the least favorite character for readers, apparently. 
because <laughs> yeah. she's a bit shallow. Although I think I, I I hope that she gets a little bit redeemed in the end as well. Oh, she does. She does. Um, but yeah. So in this scene, Lorna is a little girl who she likes to run away, not because she's unhappy at home, but because it's just fun to pack up things and you know steal lunch meat from the fridge and and go out to this place she calls the the Rocky Mountains, which is a place in the woods that's. Um, that's special to her. And um, she, somebody has been coming to her secret place. She knows because some life, lifesavers she had there have been eaten. So she's been testing to find out what, who is her friend, who's been coming. Is it a fairy? Um, is it an animal? Um, so this is, um, that's the background that you need to know for this one. Lorna gets dressed and goes outside. The sky is the smudgy gray of dirty fingerprints around a light switch. Skeleton trees striped with snow scrape against it. She heads into the woods. At the creek, the door that serves as a bridge is broken, split down the middle as if by some giant foot. The two halves lie in the water. She wades the creek in her sneakers, the cold taking her breath away. When she gets close to her rocks, she finds peanut shells strewn over the ground. She follows their trail among the boulders to where her friend made the fire. Snow has covered the fire's ashes. In the snow are footprints, big and booted, walking all over each other. She hears a rustle of paper and looks up. A man is there, standing on an incline a few feet away. He holds her journal in his hands. The man is dressed in soldier green and camouflage. He's younger than her parents, but older than the high school boys her father teaches. The bill of his cap shadows his eyes and his coat hangs from his bones. He has been bigger than he is now. Lorna knows her propensity to imagine things and she tries to de-imagine him, but he is real and does not disappear. She grasps at the manners her parents have taught her. My name's Lorna. What's yours? Her voice trembles, weak in the still air. Benson, he says. His lips barely move. The voice seems to come from a cave. The man is broken. Lorna can feel it. The bridge between his mind and heart split completely like the board across the, the creek. She reaches behind her and touches the nearest boulder. The mountain's heartbeat pulses in her fingertips. Fear melts down her body and legs into the thin covering of snow and the dead winter grass beneath it. It penetrates hard clay and runs into the veins of the mountain that spreads under Lorna and the man and out all the way to the house where her mother sits painting her toes. Mama, come get me. Her mother, Sarah, sits with her foot propped up, cotton between her toes and a magazine open beside her. She is finished with one foot and is about to paint the first stroke of pink on the other when she feels her daughter's fear enter her body and push upward to her heart. Her hand lurches, smearing nail polish. The fear squeezes the back of her neck and she is up and out the door, magazine in hand, rolling it into a hard baton as she goes. Lorna! She runs through the woods, her bare feet pounding a, pounding a wild drumbeat in the snow. Her long hair streams behind her, collecting twigs and leaves. She leaps the creek and breaks into the circle of rocks with the snarl of an animal. The man is standing in front of Lorna, about to take a step forward. Sarah lunges at him, jabbing the magazine in his face. Back off! Lorna sees the man's eyes focus. He holds up his palms. Whoa, lady. He is no longer hypnotized the way he was before. He's awake now. Her mother grabs Lorna and pushes her running toward the creek. Lorna listens for the man's footsteps on the hard ground behind them, but he doesn't follow. Her mother has her by the arm. Run, run. They burst out of the woods and into their own yard, up the steps and inside. Her mother slams the door and locks it. Lorna's father stands in the kitchen, startled. Call the police, her mother says, and for once her father does not argue. He's on the phone and dialing. 
Lorna's mother takes her to the living room and sits her down. She pulls off Lorna's wet sneakers and socks and rubs her cold feet. The two of them sit pressed together on the couch with their knees drawn up. Her mother's feet are bloody. The new polish on her nails has smeared into hard pink waves. Lorna reaches out a finger to touch. That's so lovely. And I, you do indeed redeem her entirely there. Um, you open and close the book with scenes from the point of view of the ageless mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us something about that. Yeah, um, and I also, you may have noticed, gave the mountain a little cameo in the piece that I just read. Um, the mountain gets to, to play the role of warning Sarah. But um, the, the very last story that I wrote um, is now divided into two to kind of book in the collection. So it was originally one piece, and then I locked the front off and put it at the beginning of the book and then left it, um, left the rest of it at the end as another bookend. And both, both pieces are from the point of view of the mountain. Um, I've written about this before on the Regal House blog, but I, I wanted to play around with this idea. You know, when I, um, I'm from Raleigh, but the, the place that I first felt at home was Asheville. Uh, when I first came here, um, I just felt like I belonged here in a way that I had never felt living anywhere else. Um, and when I when I come back uh, from Raleigh, when I visit my family and I, I drive up I-40 and the mountain comes around that bend, my heart just leaps up and, and I just feel so happy. <laughs> and I started I thinking- I the well, horn at that point. I honk yeah, the horn at that point. <laughs> yeah, I should start doing that. Um, and it just, one day I was thinking, well, what if that mountain is just as happy to see me as I am to see it? You know, what if the mountain loves me the same way that I love it? Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for that last piece. Um, and it allowed me to, to have a bit of omniscience. The, um, there's a, a, quite a passage of time in that last story, generations of the school, the students come and go. Um, and so it, it gave me a way to do that without too many uh, contortions, um, but it was a lot of fun to write it. Yeah, I, that was very kind of you as, as the author to give us a glimpse at these people go, continuing on, mm -hmm. you know, see, see what happened with them. I think that was just very satisfying. That was one of my feelings about, this was a satisfying end to this book. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it could have, been, could have been very unhappy, but um, this was very satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, what, what else can you tell us? You already answered one question I had about, did you write the book them separately and then bring them together? And you've already answered that. Just uh, what would you like to tell us about the book before we close? Well, you had mentioned um, the, the theme, a theme of the book kind of being, you know, what makes a hero. Um, and that is something that I um, focused on quite a bit as I was writing it. Um, one of the, the stories, um, the inspiration for the, for the hero question was this idea of, especially with World War II veterans um, who did such heroic things when they were, you know, 18 or 19 years old. Um, and I knew a couple uh, of, of those veterans who, came home, they did survive, and then they didn't, life didn't turn out the way it should have. Um, you know, they, I, I knew one who was a POW and um, wound up, uh, his wife murdered him, his alcoholic wife accidentally murdered him one night in, in middle age. And I knew another one who, um, who was such a hero and then came home and sort of uh, became a bit of a smarmy salesman type, you know? And I just started thinking, what, what, if you're once a hero, are you always a hero or, or do you forfeit that status um, if you don't live an exemplary life after that? Um, around, around the time I was thinking of all this, Timothy McVeigh committed his horrible crime, but he was a decorated soldier um so th and people were talking about not letting him being be buried in arlington cemetery and that bothered me for some reason you know even though he committed a horrible crime it 
it bothered me that that would be taken away when he actually had served in the military and done what he was told to do. And I, I don't know where I come down on that, but it, the question bothered me. So that was sort of the first ideas about heroism that I started. And then it kind of blossomed from there. And I started thinking, well, you know, it's pretty heroic to be a single mom raising four boys by yourself. So one of the stories is about a woman like that. Um, it, it was just fun to kind of explore it and expand that concept of, of being a hero. So um, I saw on Facebook, you're opening a box of advanced copies. What is your next book? Yeah, um, I, I didn't bring it in the room, unfortunately, but um, my next novel is coming out in July. It's called The Puppeteer's Daughters. Um, it's very different from this collection. It's um, it was super fun to write. It's got a lot of um, fairy tales and puppetry in it. Um, it's about a, an aging famous puppeteer, kind of a contemporary of Jim Henson, who has dementia and who announces at his 80th birthday party to his adult daughters that there's another daughter out there somewhere. So mm -hmm. they have to kind of redefine their relationships with him and with each other in order to fulfill some will conditions in order to inherit and, um, you know, come to terms with their own family relationships. So it, it, it was fun to write. I hope it'll be fun to read. <laughs> Sounds terrific. How do you juggle being a lawyer with your writing? Um, I don't always juggle it very well. <laughs> I always say imperfectly. Um, you know, in addition to lawyering full time and, and writing, I also um, co manage the Flatiron Writers Room. Um, so at various times, any of those three things can take the forefront. Um, but I really do believe that people make the time for what's important to them. So I never complain about not having enough time to write. Um, if I did, I would have to stop watching television. And I do watch a lot of <laughs> television. So I don't know. Um, it, it gets done somehow. Um, it helps that I now um, have a 23-year-old daughter. So I'm not having to actively parent her the way I did when she was 15 or three. Um, so I, I do get the writing done. I don't, I'm not able to write every day, but I do um, get back to it at least weekly. And somehow it always um, ends up getting done. I don't know. Um, how about you, Vicki? I'm curious about your writing practice. Um, recently, there hasn't been much of it. <laughs> I am a I have a, a semi collection of short stories that, you know, you are, have inspired me to go back, finish up one or two and mm -hmm. put it together. Uh, the, my book coming out as it did right when the COVID stuff started was very disappointing. You know, I couldn't go places and do things. Yeah. So um, I just kind of, you know, eh, I'll, maybe I'll move on to something else. But um, my writing process, when I am writing, is, um, you know, usually uh, late at night, working late at night mm -hmm. uh, when I've got everything else out of the way. But, you know, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's not like that. It's, uh, it'll be interesting to see if I ever really get back to trying to, you know, get, get something completed. Um, I, think, I think the fact that you are juggling so many things probably makes you a better writer. That, um, you know, you have to focus on whatever it is you're doing. I, I am um, a lot more efficient when I have a lot to do. Um, if, yeah. if I have too much free time, I'm pretty wasteful. Um, <laughs> yeah, the that's, pandemic that's has been problem. interesting for, for writers. I, I felt lucky that I was sort of in the revision process when the pandemic hit for both my story collection and the novel. I think it would have been a lot harder if I was trying to create new material uh, during the mm -hmm. pandemic. And I remember when it hit two years ago and all my friends had books coming out just as the pandemic came and I felt so bad for them. And I, it, it never dawned on me that two years later, the pandemic would, per, would Still, interfere with my book launches. <laughs> yeah, <it is> <laughs> but yeah, um, really grateful for bookstores like Malaprops that have pivoted and um, continue to uh, have events online and continue to support authors. It's 
we were really lucky to have bookstores like that. Absolutely. Um, it looks like we have a question from Patricia. Uh, what is the revision process like for you? How do you incorporate critiques at different points in your writing process? You know, it's funny for the for the McMullen Circle Collection. Um, it was a very enjoyable process because I was getting feedback from Tommy Hayes and my classmates in his class. Um, and short stories are great because they're they're finite and you can people can tell you what's not working and you can fix it within a matter of weeks. <laughs> Um, so that was a really fun revision process. The, um, the novel, The Puppeteer's Daughters, was a bit excruciating. Um, my agent made me go through several rounds of revision to the point where I was like, I am going to kill you if you make me do anything else <laughs> to this book. Um, but, you know, we got it into shape and I am happy with how it turned out. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the most enjoyable part. Um, I normally like revision. I, I love the, um, it's just something satisfying about tackling the big picture problems first and then going sentence level eventually. And I've always really enjoyed it, but I, I didn't enjoy the multiple, multiple rounds. of. <laughs> I would send it off to her and then I'd get this editorial letter back, like still not quite working. <laughs> But it was fun. It, it's it's all it's all part of the process. Absolutely. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, if you want to sum up and um, anything else you would like to tell us before oh. I hand it back to Lily. Oh, Lily, good. I, we can. I mean, I um, I'll just say I really appreciate um, the the readers. Every reader. Um, and also really appreciate Regal House Publishing, uh, who's also your publisher, Vicki, for um, mm -hmm. giving a home to this collection. Um, I had had a couple of other offers on this collection that fell through for one reason or another. And so it kind of was sitting there for a few years while I tried to figure out, you know, what do I do with this thing? And um, Regal House sponsored a contest and... Um, I, I wasn't the winner, but I was a finalist and they made the offer of publication. And I really feel like a Southern press, Regal Houses in the Triangle um, was the perfect oh, home for this. So um, yeah, I'm very, very happy that it's out in the world. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Heather. And thanks to the Zoom audience. Uh, it's been just a delight to explore this, this really fine piece of work. Um, I, as I said, I know I'll read it again and again just to enjoy the beautiful prose and to see, to learn from Heather how slyly she juggles the characters around and then brings them down just where they ought to be at the end. If you haven't read it yet, I strongly urge you to, and I urge you to support uh, Malaprops, our, our local gym. Uh, over to you, Lily. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much again to um, Heather and Vicki, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, so if you want to join us for our next reading, it'll be on March 20th, and it'll feature students from Elizabeth Lutchen's Prose Masterclass. So until then, um, just a huge thank you again to Mala Props for hosting us. Uh, please check out their amazing upcoming events. Consider supporting the store. Um, sign up for a five-week Great Smokies class if you want at greatsmokies.unca.edu, and we'll see you in March.